What happens is this. Huh? What happens is this. When we when we calculate our profit in the income statement, right? When we calculate our profit in the income statement here, okay, let's say this is a simple income statement. This is sales. Okay, we have all our expenses here. Okay. Now under expenses, we are going to have depreciation. Right? And we end up with this number which is our net profit. <coughs> have you all followed? Right? Now, this, what we do here, what we did, what the calculation we did here is okay for accounting. Right? This is perfectly alright for accounting. But, when this calculation here goes to the tax department, when the tax department looks at this, what will they do? They will first of all cancel this agreement. This depreciation will not be allowed by the tax department. So what they will do is they will increase this, they will, they will increase this by the depreciation. Okay? And they will then minus capital allowances. They will minus capital allowances. This number of capital allowances is determined by the tax department. Okay? And this capital allowances number here is, is fixed for all companies. Right? In other words, they have a tax schedule. Right? They will look at the tax schedule and say, okay. Your fixed asset will be given so much of capital allowance. So they will minus this and this will be your final net profit number on which the company will have to pay a company tax. Okay, this is what taxation is all about. Okay, can we all follow? Uh, to be to be frank with you, okay, I will take the area of this slide, the taxation, uh, is a bit very challenging. Okay? In other words, if we bring this into our calculations, our calculation will become something like accounting paper calculation. Okay? So just know this, just try to understand as best as you can. Okay, but I will not believe they will want to bring this calculation in our exam. Right? Especially the one who later to this up to up to this part is quite alright. Okay, up to this part is quite okay. You can actually see this number will come in here as a cash output. But if you go to that number, the calculations are going to be very good. So just try to understand that, okay, from the tax point of view, depreciation is not allowed. They will give us their own capital allowances. Okay, right? Okay, now, then we have relevant and irrelevant costs. Okay, what is a relevant and what is an irrelevant cost? Okay, a relevant cost has some qualities. Okay, there are three qualities here. Firstly, a relevant cost is a future expense. We are going to spend in the future. It is incremental, okay, with the decision we pay more money. And thirdly, there must be a cash outflow. There must be a cash outflow, okay? Now, an irrelevant cost is not affected by the decision, okay? An example is a research cost. We spend some money doing research before the project. This money is already spent. Now, we are deciding to go on with the project. Okay, we are deciding to go on with the project. An irrelevant cost will not affect our decision. It is already paid. Okay, it is already paid and therefore it will not affect 
our decision whether to go on with a project or not to go on. Okay? Now, the next slide, which is some cost, ties in also with the irrelevant cost. A sum cost is a cost which is already paid and is also irrelevant to the decision that we are about to pay. So a sum cost is paid before, right? Before we take a decision and therefore it is not relevant to the decision we are taking. The decision here refers to a project we are looking at. For example, to set up or to buy a, a factory, right? To, to, to set up a machinery in a factory. Okay? Now, then we come to comparison of methods. Okay, the four methods here. Let's look at the four methods very quickly. Okay, the first method is ARR. Okay, the first method is ARR. Now, ARR, the, the drawback with this method, uh, the disadvantage with this method is that this method use, it uses profit in calculations. Okay? The numbers that we use in this calculation of ARR are profit numbers, okay? And because it used profit numbers, okay, we all know that profit numbers can be subjective, right? They can be subjective, right? They can be subjective due to, right, due to using due to using accruals concept. Because we use accruals concept, the profit numbers can be subjective. Okay? So, profit numbers are not preferred. Right? They are not preferred especially by investors. Right? They do not like to use profit numbers in evaluations. So, this method ARR is the method that will be least preferred right at the end because it is using profit in calculations. Right? The second method, which is a payback method, okay, a payback method is a good method to use, a good method to use for initial screening. Right? A good method to use for initial screening. Your boss wants a quick answer from you, okay, and you need to give them a quick reply. You use this method quickly and say, yes, please go on with the project, okay, but we need to do further evaluations. The drawback, okay, or the disadvantage, the disadvantage of this project is the cash flows are not discounted. Right? Cash flows are not discounted. Okay, so what this payback assumes, right? What this payback assumes is that the one dollar now is equal to one dollar in the future. This is what the, the payback assumes. Right, which is a disadvantage. Okay, right? So good tool for initial screening, but the disadvantage is it does not consider uh, this high value of money. So this area is called a time value of money. Okay, so for this reason, uh, it is again not a very good method. Okay, just good enough to do the first screening level and then tell the boss, yes, we need to do further evaluation. The third method, which is NPV, net present values.
Now, the net present value, the third method <coughs> is among all the four, okay, among all the four, this is actually the best method. Okay, this is the best, best method to use. And every company, in fact, when they do evaluations, they will use the MPP method. Okay? Now, why is this a preferred or a best method? It is preferred. Okay, it is preferred because it is consistent. Okay, it is consistent with shareholder wealth maximization. Okay? Now, what this means is when we take a project using the NPV rule, okay, this is exactly what the shareholders of the company want us to do. Right? So when we take when we use NPV, we use the NPV rule to take a project, this is exactly what the shareholders want us to do. So we are already doing what shareholders want us to do. So we are consistent with shareholder wants. Right? So this becomes the best method. Okay? And the fourth method, which is IRR, internal rate of return. Okay? The internal rate of return is quite similar to NPV. Okay, it's quite similar. In other words, it will also give you good results, but the IRR has a big disadvantage. Okay? Now one of the this the biggest disadvantage of the IRR is that the IRR is not suitable. Right? Is not suitable when cash flows are not conventional. <coughs> right? Now, when we say that cash flows are not conventional, we mean that, okay, I'll show you what we mean there in terms of cash flow. Huh? The cash flows are something like minus positive, 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 minus, minus, positive, minus, positive, minus, minus. Now, this is non-conventional cash flow, okay? Conventional cash flows, here, minus at the beginning of the, the project, then you have all positive, positive cash flows. Okay. So, if the project is having cash flow patterns which are conventional, this is conventional cash flow, then we do not have a problem with using IRR. Okay, It will give you one IRR. But if you have this kind of cash flow patterns, then we will end up with a multiple internal rate of return. Right? You will end up with more than one internal rate of return. Which means the IRR in this situation will not work. It will actually fail. Right? Okay? So the IRR is a good method. Okay? If you have this kind of cash flows, the result in this, if you have conventional, will be the same as this. Okay? No problems here. But the moment you have these kind of cash flows, then it will not work. Okay? So this would not be the best method to use. So the best method still remains at NPV, net present value. Okay? okay, moving on to uncertainty. Now sometimes what happens is that the cash flows that are coming uh, to the company are not certain, right? Not certain means we are not very sure because there are uh, there's some 
some scenarios which may take place. Okay, some scenarios which may take place. So when there is uncertainty, we may want to calculate an expected value. Okay, this is what I mean here. Now, in this case, we have got okay, estimated sales probability of occurrence and this is expected sales. Okay? Now, what we mean here very simple situation. We are looking at three probable events or three probable scenarios like happening. Say there is a probability of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Okay? These are probability of certain scenarios happening maybe in the next year. Okay? These are estimated sales that we are looking at. Again, these are all just simple numbers. I say this is 2,000, this is 3,000 for this scenario, and this is $1,500 for this scenario. Okay, so these are three possible scenarios. This must add up to 1.0. Okay, so expected sales. Okay, expected sales here is going to be 400. Expected sales here is 900. And expected sales here is 750. So add up the total, this is 2050. Okay? Now, what we are trying to do here is that in a situation where we are not sure of these scenarios, okay? We will then take this number which is called an expected value. Right? This is an expected value. What three scenarios are we talking about for next year? Okay, for next year, we are looking at 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Right? So what are the scenarios we are looking at? Well, 0 0.5, okay, maybe we are looking at we will enter a recession. We do not know. Okay, so this is a situation of a recession, okay? Uh, point three is a situation of being <coughs> just in neutral growth, okay? And point two is a situation where the economy will just grow by just a small growth. So this is a slow growth. Okay? So if we are not sure of certain scenario, we will try to get the probability and try to get an expected value there for our calculations. Okay, this is uh, referring to the uncertain okay, where we have some probability of occurrence. Sorry, this one should change to O. This changes to the occurrence. Uh, probability of occurrence to get an expected value. Now, the next one is sensitivity analysis, okay? Now, sensitivity analysis is where we are trying to look at the area of risk, okay? We are trying to look at the area of risk. So, what we do in the area of sensitivity analysis is to make a change to a variable. We are trying to make a change to a variable uh, to determine the impact of, on NPV. So here, the basic idea, okay, the basic idea in a sensitivity analysis is to freeze. Okay, freeze means don't change, don't change all variables. Okay, don't change all variables except one. Okay, so we look at the variables, we just change one. And then 
determine how sensitive right how sensitive the net present value is to a change right to a change in this variable okay now let's use a very simple example huh? okay example we did our NPV calculations the first time now we are doing a sensitivity analysis we increase okay we increase the machine cost we increase the machine cost by 10 